Um, so a little bit of introduction. Uh, Dr. Klassen is Associate Professor in Literature and Media in the English Department at Aarhus University, sorry for the pronunciation, That's in perfect. Denmark. <laughs> His research spe um, specialty is frightening entertainment and he is the director of the Recreational Fear Lab. His most recent book is Why Horror Seduces and he is currently finishing a new book on the psychology of horror movies. And then our other speaker today is Colton Scribner. He's a PhD student in the Department of Comparative Human Development and a fellow at the Institute for Mind and Biology at the University of Chicago. His research specializes in the psychology of morbid curiosity. So um, I'm just gonna let you guys get started. Um, and if, you, if anyone has questions, feel free to, uh, sorry, feel free to message Maddie or um, I and we can kind of start to make a list of those. So are we going to do questions at the end of the at talk? At the end, okay. yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome. So what uh, what Colton and I uh, arranged was that I would go first. Um, so I'll spend about 20 minutes saying a little bit about horror and some of my work on horror. And then Colton will take over and he will take us deep into the darkest recesses of the machine room of uh, the psychology of horror. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, if my sound is less than perfect, please let me know. I stole my son's gamer headset. Um, so, uh, but let's see, let's see how it goes. So I'm just gonna try to share on my screen. I should be, I should be a pro at this by now, but I'm kind of old, so I think I'm excused. Um, and Okay, do you see you see a slide that says why we watch? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm not really going to introduce myself because um, Beckett just did, um, but I wanted to mention again the Recreational Fear Lab, which is a new thing. We just recently established the Recreational Fear Lab because I was uh, insanely lucky to get a big grant to um, to do three years of empirical horror research. I also wanted to point to my book. Um, it's available in an inexpensive paperback edition and I got a terrible contract. So uh, I think I'm morally um, okay to recommend the book. Uh, it's a quick read, you know, it's about 200 pages and it's about the stuff I've been doing so far. But the first thing I really wanted to do was to show you a film clip. Uh, it's a trailer. It's not insanely creepy, but take a look at it. Katie, she thinks there's something in the house. I don't know. You believe me, right? I think we're gonna have a very interesting time capturing whether paranormal phenomena is occurring or is not occurring. Windows are locked, doors are locked, alarm is on. It's hearing a weird sound. Something's here. I feel it breathing on me. There's footsteps in the room, more footsteps out. Oh, God. Oh, my God. If you do try to play games with it, that's inviting it in. Jesus, looks like something big here. It's not the house, it's me. You cannot run from this and follow you. You're in control. You're not in control. What's happening to me? Message. It's, it's not a ghost. What is it? Okay, so um, so obviously that was the trailer for a paranormal activity, which I think uh, probably many of you have seen it already. Um, it quickly rose to prominence, uh, partly because it is extremely cheaply made and made a lot of money for the production company, uh, Blumhouse, which is now a major player um, on the horror field. But what is interesting about this trailer, I think, is that it doesn't really tell you what the movie is about. 
uh, it is at least equally focused on the response of this test audience. So normally we expect a, a theatrical trailer to give us some, usually too much actually, too much plot, um, too much information about what a film is going to be about. But we only learned that this is about a couple of young people and some kind of, some kind of malign presence in their home. Uh, the trailer is more interested in showing us how this uh, audience reacts. And that brings us close to something uh, that is called the paradox of horror. Um, because why is it that somebody thinks that telling people how bad this particular film is going to make them feel is a viable marketing strategy? I mean, you saw the, you saw the little snippets from um, reviews, um, genuinely terrifying, and people were physically shaken. I mean, who in their right mind pays money to be genuinely terrified and physically shaken? That right there is the paradox of horror. The fact that it's weird that so many people uh, are willing to pay to be frightened by entertainment. Um, but at this point you might be thinking, how many people actually seek out horror movies or Stephen King novels or horror video games or go to haunted houses? Isn't it like a niche phenomenon? Um, that turns out not to be the case. So along with a couple of colleagues, including a, a personality psychologist and a media scholar, I did a study a few years back where we asked more than a thousand Americans about their relationship to horror. And so if you ask people, do you like horror media? More than half, about 55% say, yes, I like the scary stuff. 17% are kind of on the fence. Uh, and the remaining 28% uh, say, no, I don't like that stuff. So it's not a tiny subset of the population that likes horror. It's actually most people who claim to enjoy frightening media, suggesting that the paradox is real. There is something here that we need to understand. It's a widespread phenomenon. The, um, the, 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 the scientifically intriguing, um, fascination with uh, scary stories that so many of us feel. Um, another uh, misunderstanding that I often come across is that horror is a predominantly male genre, that it's mainly guys who like horror movies. Uh, but we also looked at that in our study. And it turns out there are uh, systematic and predictable gender differences, but they're not very big. So what you see on my graph here is a comparison of males and females um, in response to different uh, items, including do you like horror? And we see males as well as females um, respond fairly positively. Uh, frequency of horror use, males use uh, horror media slightly more often than females, but not very much so. Uh, and also males tend to uh, prefer horror movies that are slightly more frightening than females do but it's not a huge difference. The biggest difference, um, which points in the opposite direction is that females um, say that they're more easily scared of horror, which could mean that women tend to respond more strongly to frightening entertainment, or that they're more willing to admit when they're frightened by a movie, or it could be a combination, you know, a combination of biology and socialization. So um, horror entertainment, uh, it's paradoxical. It's a genre that takes its name from an emotion, a compound emotion. Horror itself you know, is a mixture of maybe fear and disgust or fear and dread. It's a genre that is very often marketed on its ability to instill those emotions in the audience. Um, it's a genre that appeals to most people and to males as well as females. Um, but it's not only about the negative emotions. It's not only about the fear and the disgust and the anxiety and the dread. Um, if you look at this graph, which I admit is sort of messy, uh, what you see is the emotions an individual expects to experience when they're watching a horror movie, depending on whether they enjoy horror or not. So all the way to the right where it says strongly agree, those are horror fans. And all the way to the left, where it says strongly disagree, those are 
non-fans. And if you look at the purple bars in the middle, that's the amount of fear somebody expects to feel when they're watching a horror film. Everybody expects to feel high amounts of uh, high levels of fear, the fans as well as the non-fans. But if you look at the blue bar to the left, which indicates the amount of joy somebody expects to feel, you'll notice that non-fans don't really expect to feel joy when they're watching a horror film, but horror fans do. So there is a kind of mixture of emotions. If you enjoy horror, you expect to be frightened and you expect to feel joy through that fear. So it's a co-activation basically of positive and negative emotion. Now, one thing that really interests me about horror is how ancient uh, this uh, mode of storytelling seems to be. So we can find um, the roots of horror. Well, they're kind of difficult to find actually because the roots of horror get lost in the mists of prehistory. Uh, but I'm sure many of you have uh, been exposed to folk tales when you were kids. Uh, the Brothers Grimm, for example, which is basically a treasure trove of scary stories involving child-eating witches and you know other cannibals and trolls and um, talking animals that eat little girls and so on. And so it seems to be the case that even um, in ancient uh, hunter-gatherer societies, people would entertain each other with scary stories. But possibly it wasn't just entertainment. Um, so there is some historical evidence to suggest that historically horror stories have served an important function of behavioral regulation. So if you want somebody to behave in a certain way, tell them a scary story. Like if you want your kids to brush their, their teeth, you can go the pedagogical route and tell them about uh, bacteria and the things that happen to teeth when they eat candy and they don't brush their teeth and so on. They don't listen. Tell them about a scary clown that lives in the sewers and comes at night to extract their teeth one by one, maybe open a vein and drink their blood while it's hot and steaming. They're going to brush their teeth. Uh, and we see this in religion also. Religions have been using scary stories to shape the behavior um, of believers. Now, horror stories, even though they're ancient and they have probably been with us for as long as our species has had the ability to construct uh, imaginary worlds. So for as long as we have been using our imagination to construct these scary uh, make-believe worlds and share them with other people through language, um, the genre really crystallized in the so-called uh, Gothic romance which is a, it's, it's, a, it's a literary genre that comes into being in the late 18th century. And that is really popular from around um, 1790 until 1830 or so. Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is one example of a Gothic story. Uh, many of these Gothic stories are kind of melodramatic and they remind me more than anything of uh, Twilight, which is sort of ironic because Twilight and paranormal romance, you know, um, the vampire diaries and so on. They annoy a lot of horror fans because they use horror elements, uh, vampires, werewolves and so on, but they're romantic, they're not real horror. But actually they're quite close to, to the roots of modern horror, which is the Gothic romance. So that's a little bit of irony for you. Now, uh, in addition to being an ancient genre, horror exists across media. So you can find horror literature. And here's a, here a page from uh, The Shining by Stephen King, which is one of my favorite horror novels. Uh, you get horror, horror, horror uh, movies and horror video games. Uh, horror novels have an advantage because they can put you into the minds of fictional characters. So in this particular scene from The Shining, we're following Danny, who's a young boy, snowed in at a hotel that is haunted. And then he has been told he cannot go into room 217. So he goes into room 217 and he sees a ghost, like a zombie ghost in a tub. And so King gives us a description of the rotting ghost zombie lady. And that is a very unpleasant uh, representation to hold in your mind. It's not, it's not a very nice image. But we also get a description of Danny's response to the zombie ghost lady. And because we feel empathy and sympathy for Danny, he's a very likable character. We mirror his response 
And so that creates a kind of um, double whammy or a very potent cocktail of emotions. Uh, revulsion and fear in response to the creepy image and also sympathetic dread in response to Danny's situation. So that's an advantage of horror novels and, and, and horror literature, that they can put us into the minds of characters. Uh, horror films are less good at giving us psychological access, but then horror films uh, have the jump scare. And the jump scare, you all know a jump scare, right? Uh, nowadays, a horror movie has an average of about 10 jump scares. Uh, it used to be less, but in the 60s, it was 2.5 jump scares per film on average. Um, and now it's 10. And a jump scare is a combination of a sudden sound and a creepy image that produces a startled response. So you go, Ooh, right? Um, it's basically the cinematic version of the boo. Um, and it's really effective. And it has a bad reputation for being too easy, uh, primitive. But some of the best jump scares are real, real works of art. Uh, my own personal favorite is from uh, The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. Uh, if you haven't seen that show, you might want to go check it out. Uh, there is one of the episodes in which I'm not going to give it away, but I think I flatlined for about five seconds. I mean, that really made me jump out of my skin. And that was a, that was a jump scare that wasn't signaled. You know, usually you can tell when a jump scare is coming up. Uh, but sometimes you can't. Um, and so that's something horror movies do really well. Uh, the image here is from the Blair Witch Project, which is a so-called found footage horror film. Uh, it's not the first found footage, but it's, it's the horror film that really put um, this subgenre into the mainstream. And a found footage horror film is a horror film that pretends to be documentary. It pretends to be real. It has a kind of authenticity aesthetic. It looks like it was shot on you know, home video cameras to to make it appear real, to, to decrease the psychological distance between you, the viewer, and the things you see on screen. But one of the interesting things about Blair Witch Project, which really terrified a lot of people, uh, is that you don't really see anything scary. Uh, what you see for 90 minutes is three uh, young people messing around in a wood, uh, looking frightened. And it's really effective because we mirror their emotional response through their facial um, their facial uh, reaction. And that's why horror movies so often dwell on so-called reaction shots, which is when the camera dwells on the, on the facial expression of a character. You see a similar thing in The Exorcist, for example, where almost every scene involving a uh, little Reagan who's possessed by a demon um, actually is bookended by uh, reaction shots of her mom responding. So we mirror it. Now, the, the, the third image is from a horror video game called uh, Amnesia, the Dark Descent, uh, a so-called survival horror video game. The video game um, can do some of the same things that the horror movie can do, and then it adds the element of interaction. So your behavior as a player has consequences for the way in which the story unfolds. And that element of interaction gives a stronger sense of investment in the story. Uh, you feel that you are responsible for the things that are happening and you feel it is you inside the creepy digital world. And that's why when people talk about a horror video game they played, they will retell their experiences using the first person. So they'll say, I fought the monster. I escaped the monster. They don't say that when they retell the plot of a horror movie. Um, so that element of immersion can create an even stronger um, emotional stimulation, which is why horror video games can be so scary. Another phenomenon I wanted to point to is the haunted house, which of course is, a, is an American tradition. It goes back more than 100 years, but it really exploded in the 1970s um, after the opening of the haunted mansion in Disney World. And now it's, a, now it's a global phenomenon. We have haunted houses in Denmark. I went to China a couple of years ago and I visited two haunted houses in Beijing. Uh, and the haunted house is cool because um, it puts you in the shoe, you, you become the protagonist in a, an empirical physical world that is full of cues of danger. So these are visitors in a haunted house who respond very strongly to this guy, a big guy uh, with a pig's mask and a chainsaw who comes running at them from, from a dark place. 
Um, and so haunted houses can also have scare actors really breach your zone of intimacy, get way too close to you. Uh, they can play on all the senses, including the sense of smell, which a horror movie or literature or, or video game cannot do. Um, people respond powerfully. So these are a couple of guests in this Danish haunted house. Uh, even people like this guy, you know, a guy I would not want to meet in a dark alley. Um, he is chased by a teenage girl in zombie makeup and he looks really frightened. Um, here's another group where you see a whole range of uh, different uh, responses on these guests who are caught on a, on a, on a camera. Uh, I want you to focus on the guy um, here. If you look at his face, uh, he's really happy with uh, something that's, that's happening uh, by his left arm, right? I, I think he was, he, he's on a date, I think. And he's really happy because the girl holds on to him for comfort. It's called the snuggle effect. You know, it's something we fairly often see with horror media, that people use it as a uh, date entertainment because it brings people closer, literally. Um, it, it generates arousal, physiological arousal, which sometimes translates into mutual attraction. And so because haunted houses are such treasure troves of um, fright behavior and psychology, We've been doing studies in a Danish haunted house since 2016 using volunteer uh, research assistants. Um, Colton has been involved in several of the studies and these other of my two good colleagues, Uffe on the, in the top and uh, Mark at the bottom have also been involved. And the first study we did, uh, we looked at fear regulation. So we looked at what visitors will do to regulate their own fear. So we recruited uh, almost 300 visitors and we gave them a challenge to either try to maximize their fear or minimize their fear. And the people in this picture are trying to minimize fear. You can kind of tell it from their posture. And these people are trying to maximize fear and it looks like it's working. And so we looked at how, how much fear people felt in these two groups, not these particular groups, but the, but the larger categories. And it turns out, that people who try to maximize fear feel significantly more fear than those who try to minimize it. It is not possible to switch off the fear. You can't do that. And that's because the fear system is uh, relatively encapsulated. It's inaccessible to rational cognitive control, but you can moderate it. You can turn it down a notch. But when we look at satisfaction, it turns out that people in both groups thought it was really funny, which suggests to us that there are two different kinds of uh, horror fans, adrenaline junkies who seek out horror for maximum stimulation and white knucklers who see horror as a kind of challenge in keeping their own fear at a tolerable level. So for a white knuckler, a horror movie is a challenge in making, making it through with your mental health intact, basically. Uh, and they like that, they enjoy that. So we did a second study involving more research assistants and an assault on my lab coat, where we looked at the, the relationship between uh, fear and enjoyment. And we found that there is a sweet spot where people experience just the right amount of fear and they find it really pleasurable. Too much fear is overwhelming, too little fear is boring. So you want just the sweet spot. And that's something we could measure using um, using uh, um, heart rate monitors and uh, behavioral measures. So videos like this one, in which uh, some of our research assistants come into a room and then this creepy scare actor has a monologue uh, and the monologue has uh, two functions. One function is to unsettle um, the guests because he says some really, really weird things. And the second function is to distract the guests because under the table behind the guests is a hidden zombie. And the zombie hiding inside that table is waiting for a cue for the scare actor with the monologue. So in a moment, the scare actor, he's gonna go over, he's gonna knock a metal thing onto the floor. And that is the zombie's cue. And you wanna look at the girl on the right. Um, she gets a real fright, you know, she's holding her heart in a minute like that. Um, and so we, we, get this, uh, we get this behavior from the surveillance cameras that we put inside the haunt. We get self-report from asking uh, students. 
and we um, we get the physiological data. So that's really cool. And that study is published, I think, uh, probably on Monday. Uh, this year, we also did uh, haunted house research, but we had to use a huge tent uh, because of Corona and um, social distancing. Um, and I think Colton is going to tell you more about this particular study, which was a lot of fun. We, we were hoping to continue through the month of October, but the haunted house has to had to shut down because um, COVID-19 cases were spiking in Denmark, and so they pulled the plug. Uh, but that's what I wanted to say, um, and now I want to pass on the word to, to Colton. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to see if I can just share my screen straight from this. Okay, can you guys uh, see the, the picture? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Matthias gave a really great primer uh, on horror. So for my portion, I'm going to dive into some specifics about why people seek out horror and what they really get out of it. So I'm gonna start right where he left off with Dystopia Haunted House. Uh, as he mentioned, we conducted a study this year that just wrapped up last week. Uh, so I'll be talking about some new data that uh, really hardly anyone except Matthias and myself uh, has seen. So why do people go to horror movies, read scary stories, or fight their way through haunted houses? The go-to answer uh, is often for the adrenaline rush, right? And so Matthias mentioned these adrenaline junkies, as they're affectionately called, uh, and they derive a great deal of pleasure from exciting experiences. And often these experiences involve danger or some sort of potential danger. So things like skydiving or uh, cage diving with sharks or going through a haunted house. So in addition to the sweaty palms and racing heart, the pupil dilation and other uh, physiological changes that occur in response to dangerous situation, the body also produces uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine. So dopamine release causes experiences to feel rewarding and to feel good. Uh, so as with anything else, there are individual differences in dopamine release and in receptor binding and these lead to differences in how people feel. So if they feel more or less rewarded or if they have more uh, of a mood boost or not. So for example, people who score high in thrill seeking, uh, who really enjoy uh, high sensation, high thrill events have fewer receptors for dopamine in the brain. So since receptor binding is what determines the response to dopamine, fewer uh, receptors means that the same amount of dopamine actually leads to a bigger response. So in other words, it's easier to make a thrill seeker feel rewarded from uh, a really thrilling experience. So in our study this year at Dystopia, we gave people a questionnaire that allowed us to categorize them as either adrenaline junkies, the people high in thrill seeking who like to maximize arousal, or white knucklers, the people who uh, are genuinely afraid of horror and tend to minimize arousal. And so we categorized people based on their response to this uh, survey that we created. And then when they come out of the haunt, we ask them, how good do you feel right now based on your experience inside the haunt? So as you might expect, uh, adrenaline junkies reported that they felt great, uh, whereas white knucklers reported feeling about the same as when they came in uh, and sometimes a bit lower. However, a substantial portion of the people who came to the haunt were white knucklers, uh, approximately half of them probably. And so if they're not getting a mood boost, if they don't feel good after the haunt, then why are they coming? So here's a great example of a white knuckler. Uh, yeah, in fact, you can see his white knuckles uh, on his hand there from clenching his fist and the blood escaping from the knuckles. So that's where the, the term comes from. So what does someone like this get from the haunt if not a mood boost? Uh, so in addition to asking people how they felt after the haunt, so we asked them, you know, how good do you feel? We also asked them if they felt like they had learned something about themselves or if they feel like they had developed as a person. It's kind of a weird question. Uh, however, we did find that white knucklers, but not adrenaline junkies, reported that they felt like they learned something about themselves or that they developed as a person due to their experience inside the haunt. So rather than getting a mood boost from uh, the adrenaline or the dopamine rush, the white knucklers appear to be getting something more personal out of the haunt. So Matthias kind of alluded to this uh, from their initial study back, I think, in maybe 2016, which sort of uh, inspired some aspects of the study we did this year. So here are some of the things that our white knucklers said when we asked them what they learned about themselves. So they would say things like, uh, I learned that I can survive my worst nightmare, or that I listen to my gut when I'm under pressure, or that I can handle more than I thought I could, uh, or that I'm good at handling stressful situations and thinking rationally during them, that I can be brave for others, 
or that I'm more scared of the unexpected than the expected. And some of them also mentioned their ability to immerse themselves and not, not feel like they're silly for sort of immersing in this, uh, this interactive haunt and that they're better at making decisions during these stressful situations. So this provides sort of the second story for why people like horror. Uh, the adrenaline junkies get the mood boost, the white knucklers get kind of a sense of accomplishment, like they've conquered their fears and they've learned something uh, about themselves. So up until now, uh, we've sort of been talking about what people get out of recreational fear right after it happens. So what's the, the proximate explanation, right? But why do people seek out frightening material in the first place? As Matthias mentioned, these stories are very old. Humans have been telling them for a long time and, and, and basically every culture that we know of. Uh, so the, the most immediate reason why people do things would be you know, because it feels good. Or, so wh why do people go to horror movies? Well, because they think it'll be fun or they think it will be scary or they think that uh, it's a good way, it's a, it's a good date, right? Uh, another approximate mechanism connected to the first is that the adrenaline or the dopamine rush uh, promotes their, their approach to these kinds of things. But we should also be interested in what are called ultimate explanations. These are explanations for why some behavior exists in the first place. Uh, so the fact that humans do seek out fear is a bit of a paradox, like Matthias mentioned uh, early on in his talk. So how or why would this behavior have evolved? And one explanation that uh, I've been working on in my PhD is that humans possess varying degrees of morbid curiosity and this sort of influences their willingness to seek out dangerous material. So morbid curiosity uh, is something that people are, are, tend to be familiar with and they have kind of a lay conception of what this is. And so all I'm doing is trying to turn it into a more scientific uh, concept that we can test empirically. And so I've been defining it as a motivation to seek out information about threatening or dangerous material. And so this is not uh, mutually exclusive with the neurotransmitter or mood accounts of why people seek out recreational fear. But rather, it's just a supplementary explanation that helps make sense of the behavior more generally in our species. So the rationale behind morbid curiosity is that the world is a very dangerous place, and it has been for, you know, the entirety of our, of our species history. And so we often do what we can to avoid danger, which makes quite a bit of sense from a biological perspective. If you avoid danger, you tend to avoid death. And if you avoid death, you're more likely to pass on your genes to the next generation. And you're more likely to help your offspring pass on their genes to the next generation. And based on my research, there seems to be uh, four broad categories that morbidly curious behavior boils down to. So these categories are minds of dangerous people, supernatural danger, body violations, and interpersonal violence. So minds of dangerous people is one that uh, you're probably familiar with. This is the basis of true crime. True crime podcasts, documentaries, and books are wildly popular, especially right now. And the star of the true crime story is the killer. Uh, we love to know why the killer did what he did, uh, how he did it, you know, were there any behavioral tells that we could pick up on that would have predicted this. So as this relates to morbid curiosity, the idea is that if you know something about the mind of a dangerous person, you're in a better position to identify and avoid dangerous people in the future. So you build a sort of predictive framework that might help you identify future dangerous people based on what you've learned about the behaviors of other dangerous people. In this case, dangerous people that you uh, saw on a documentary or read in a book or listened to on a podcast. Supernatural danger is an interesting one. Presumably many of the dangers that fall into this category don't actually exist. So how would our minds have evolved uh, to detect or to be interested in these things if they don't actually exist? Well, the idea is that it's sort of cognitively co-opting the same mechanisms that are operating in say, the minds of dangerous people category. So our minds still perceive them as if they do exist. Uh, in fact, one thing that's common among ghosts or aliens or monsters and other things that fall into this category uh, is that they're difficult to directly access or perceive. So there's this element of the unknown when it comes to these dangers. Uh, you know, we're sure that serial killers exist and that they are dangerous, but what about a ghost? You know, is he more like Casper, the friendly ghost or is something more sinister? Or is the alien, you know, friendly uh, do they come in peace or are they ready to destroy our world? And so even if we are sure that it's dangerous, uh, like the woman here, uh, we still know very little about the supernatural phenomenon, right? So we know very little about this woman uh, because they are difficult to directly access. And so this causes our minds to value information about them and this piques our curiosity. The third category is body violation. 
So any number of things can damage our bodies and damage to our bodies can lead to death. So in this way, it's important to know uh, or understand the limits of the human body. So you can see here lots of examples of, uh, of autopsies, many of them from the 17, 1800s, uh, where they were really popular to have in like a public auditorium where you could go and watch the autopsy. And so this can lead to a fascination or interest in what the body looks like when it's damaged. In other words, what are the consequences of dangerous things? So things that might fall into this category are, you know, interest in autopsies uh, or amputation procedures or mummification uh, or any kind of sort of in injury of the body and what it would look like. And so this category is particularly interesting to me because uh, almost without exception, things that fall into the body violation category also produce disgust. And disgust factors are repulsive and they tend to lead to avoidance and almost all of the all of the scientific literature on disgust. You know, you often cringe and you look away. Um, however, it's still important to know something about those injuries because they're really a wealth of knowledge about what caused it, how bad is it, what it happens to me. Uh, and again, this kind of piques our curiosity. So after we cringe and look away, we sometimes try to sneak an extra peek uh, so that we can learn about it. And the final category is interpersonal violence. Uh, so the violence is, uh, you know, can be scary and, and produce elements of disgust like blood. Uh, we're still drawn to it, uh, sometimes voluntarily through things like MMA or boxing matches, sometimes involuntarily. So if you're walking down the street uh, and a fight breaks out, or if in my background uh, there was a fight going on, would you stop and watch it and stop listening to me? Uh, my guess is that almost all of you would. It sort of demands our attention. Uh, and it's important for any species, but especially a social species like humans, to know about violence that's occurring in the environment, because this can tell them something about who the dangerous people are, uh, how to avoid becoming a victim, uh, to what extent violence is acceptable or not acceptable in their community. So it's a really important tool, even for, for cultural knowledge. So we like to avoid dangerous situations, but we can also be curious about them. So the avoidance behaviors keep us safe and the approach behaviors help us learn about the situations so that we can be safe. So our mind has to calculate the sort of cost benefit analysis of the situation. So how likely is it that paying attention or learning about some dangerous situation right now puts your life in danger? And does this outweigh the benefits of learning about the situation? So if the costs are higher than the benefits, you're probably going to avoid it. But if the benefits appear to outweigh the costs, you might approach it and actually try to learn about it. So this takes us back to recreational fear. Recreational fear is a bit like play fighting in animals. So uh, animals of all sorts, uh, most mammals and including humans, uh, play fight. And the proximate explanation for why like a lion cub or a wolf pup will play fight is probably that they get a dopamine rush from it or at least it's, you know, their uh, hormonal analog for dopamine. It's fun for lack of a better word. Uh, but like the dopamine account of recreational fear it doesn't really explain why the behavior exists in the first place. Why is it fun? Why do you get a dopamine rush from play fighting? Why would evolution have tinkered with the brains of lions and humans such that they enjoy something like play fighting? Uh, and so one explanation, a, a more ultimate explanation is that it prepares them for the future. So play fighting allows juveniles of the species to practice motor skills and behavioral strategies that can serve them in the future. If this is a predator, this could be something like what the, the lion and, and wolf pups are doing here. You see the sort of adult analogs as well. Uh, and if it's a uh, more of a prey species, then it could be something like chase or in humans tag. And so, uh, you know, the idea is that this comes in a very low cost fashion. The risk of injury is very low when you're play fighting, uh, especially compared to the potential learning benefits. So could the same be said for recreational fear? So news of the uh, novel coronavirus that was spreading in China reached the US sometime in January. So you can see that on the graph here. Uh, this is a, this little bump here is about mid-January. So this is a Google, uh, Google Trends graph for Google searches for the word coronavirus in the US. And so there's this massive surge in mid-March between about March 11th and March uh, 14th. And this is when the US banned international travel due to uh, the coronavirus pandemic. So it makes sense that people were searching for coronavirus because this is the time in which coronavirus was becoming very salient for people, right? It was now impacting their lives because it was impacting their ability to travel. The graph on the bottom looks very similar to the graph on the top. In fact, there's this small bump in January 
And then there's this massive surge in mid-March, again, about March 11th to March 14th. Uh, however, this graph is Google searches for the movie Contagion, a nine-year-old film about a pandemic. So why on earth would people be searching for a nine-year-old film about a pandemic uh, around the same time that they're searching for information about a real-world pandemic? I found this pretty intriguing and decided to look into uh, what was going on. In particular, who were the people who were watching pandemic movies during a pandemic? Because at the time, at least anecdotally, it seemed to be sort of split. There were some people who were avoiding pandemic movies at all costs. And there were some people who were binge watching Contagion uh, and any other kind of pandemic film that they could find. So using the morbid curiosity scale, which is a scale or a survey that I've created to assess straight morbid curiosity, I found that people who were more morbidly curious, people who scored higher on the scale, uh, were watching more pandemic films than they normally do during the pandemic. So normally these people watch more pandemic films anyway, but during the pandemic, they were watching even more than they normally do. I also found that people who were high in morbid curiosity were watching more horror films than usual. So not only were they not watching movies about a pandemic during a pandemic, they were also watching uh, stress-inducing horror films during a stressful, uncertain time. So Matthias and I found this pretty interesting, I think. Uh, especially since we discussed before, you know, this idea that maybe people learn certain skills or emotion regulation strategies when they watch horror films. Uh, so we decided to test this more explicitly using COVID-19 as a sort of uh, natural manipulation of sorts. So our basic question was, do people who watch horror films show more psychological resilience during the pandemic? And the idea here is that, you know, they've seen this before, right? They've practiced the situation, they've simulated the situation in fiction. And so maybe they're a little bit better at dealing with it when it actually occurs. So we created a, a psychological resilience scale that was more appropriate for a drawn out event like a pandemic. Uh, and then we surveyed people and asked them to complete this scale and tell us about uh, how they were doing during the pandemic. Were they feeling anxious or depressed? Were they feeling irritable or losing sleep? You know, were they feeling like they were able to find interesting things to do in life during the pandemic? Did they feel prepared for the pandemic? And then we asked them to tell us about their uh, movie and TV show genre preferences. So are they horror fans or romance fans or comedy fans? Uh, and then we also had them complete the morbid curiosity scale. And so we had three main findings from this study. So the first main finding was that horror fans did report less uh, psychological distress during the pandemic. So this means that horror fans told us that they were feeling less anxious, uh, less depressed, less irritable than people who were not horror fans. The second main finding was that people who were fans of prepper genres, so here prepper genres uh, are a combination of uh, being a fan of apocalyptic films, zombie films, and alien invasion films. And the reason that we combine these into the prepper genre were that these, these three subgenres of horror uh, were all sort of centered around this idea that there's this catastrophic event and now the world uh, no longer operates like it normally does. So in some ways, very similar to a pandemic obviously a bit exaggerated in something like a zombie movie, uh, but many of the general details are the same. So we combine these, uh, these variables into the prepper genre, uh, and we found that people who were fans of prepper genres, in addition to reporting less psychological distress, also felt like they were more prepared for the pandemic. So they would tell us that they knew what items to buy in preparation for coronavirus, or that you know, the consequences didn't catch them by surprise. And the third main finding was that morbidly curious people reported more positive psychological resilience during the pandemic. So this, were, this means that uh, people who were morbidly curious were able to find things that they enjoyed during the pandemic. They were able to sort of enjoy life even though life was stressful. Uh, and a lot of times this, this could come from, uh, for example, finding the pandemic kind of interesting, right? Uh, this alleviates some of, the, some of the distress that comes along with uncertain uh, events like, pand like a pandemic. And so the basic idea there was that uh, you know, people had practiced these uh, emotion regulation skills, you know, they, they learned how to be anxious and uh, overcome that because they watched a lot of horror films. And so when they were faced with something that was anxiety inducing or produced a lot of uncertainty in the real world, uh, they probably had the strategies to deal with that a bit, a bit better than people who didn't watch as many horror films. So where do we go from here? Uh, so Matthias and I have been working together on some new studies looking at how horror films might actually be helpful for people with certain mental health conditions like clinical anxiety or depression. And the idea here is that 
Because horror demands attention, it forces you to focus on whatever threat is on the screen. Uh, so this can help an somebody with, say, clinical anxiety shift uh, whatever they're ruminating about uh, in their life to, to focusing on a specific thread in the film. So this causes the feelings that are associated with the rumination, the feelings of anxiety to sort of shift and now become associated with the monster on the screen. So when the movie ends, uh, the thread is over and the feelings of anxiety can go away. So in addition to that, you get this nice adrenaline or dopamine rush that I talked about earlier, which can help stabilize your mood or even boost it. And so while we don't have too much uh, empirical evidence on this yet, it is something that many horror fans will often mention. So you'll find dozens of op-eds or Reddit threads like the ones uh, on the screen of people talking about how they use horror to deal with a variety of mental health issues from trauma to PTSD to depression. Uh, but the most common, commonly mentioned one is anxiety. So I, uh, I think we're pretty much out of time. I'm right at 20 minutes, I think. So I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions since we covered a lot of different material. Uh, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now or at least exit out of the full screen. Okay, should we uh, move into questions? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, if people have questions that they just want to say, feel free to like unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, but I can also start off with some of the ones sent in to me. Um, so Evan asked, is there a type of horror that you guys have seen that tends to scare people the most? Like, is it um, uh, like maybe possession or ghosts or clowns or something, which those might be ultra specific, but maybe back into the category that Colton, you were describing earlier. Um, did you guys find anything along those lines? Matias, do you want to tackle that one first? You probably have more experience with that than I do. Yeah, but not nothing like systematic. Um, yeah. But when we ask people, uh, what kind of horror do you prefer? Uh, most people seem to say that they like psychological horror. Yeah. And that comes from a very basic distinction between psychological and supernatural horror. And of course, you can break it down into ever more fine grained categories. Um, you can also do a typology of horror that matches very well with uh, Colton's four facets of morbid curiosity. Um, but I also know that people who believe in the supernatural find supernatural horror movies more frightening than people who don't believe it, which is not very surprising. I mean, if you believe in ghosts, the concept of the ghost is going to be more psychologically close to you. It's going to be perceived as more plausible. Um, than if you don't believe in it, but I don't have any, you know, a good solid answer to the question. Yeah, I, I, I think in some of the studies I've done, we've asked people things similar to this or measured fear levels, you know, in response to maybe different uh, genres or things. And it seems like it's pretty split. Like some people will say in their open, open-ended responses that they find uh, something like uh, true crime scarier because it can actually happen, right? Like, Mm. They, they'll say things like, I'm not afraid of a ghost because I, I know that the ghost isn't going to kill me, but there are serial killers out there, right? So that scares me. And then I've had other people who will say the complete opposite, that, uh, you know, the suspense and the, the unknown associated with, with supernatural stories really scares them. So I think that there's probably some, you know, systematic individual differences that, uh, that we haven't found yet, but that seem to exist that uh, cause people to be more afraid of either kind of the unknown or the things that could exist uh, that they just need to identify, basically. This may be something we should do, look into at some point. I mean, and, and it, it, uh, it, um, it ties into, a, it's an argument I've had with my wife for 20 years now. We've been married 20 years um, because we have a basement that is ultra creepy and the laundry machine is in the basement. And almost every night somebody has to go to the basement to you know, switch off the laundry machine. And I don't want to go because of the ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts at all. I'm Danish. Uh, we're all atheists here, except I kind of do when it's dark outside and I'm alone. So I don't want to go to the basement because of the ghosts. My wife does not want to go because of the psycho killer with the hockey mask and the ax. Um, and so that, that is just one example of from, from, you could go together. 20 years and Matthias never considered the fact that they could go together to the basement. Is it really that simple? And here I've been talking about the snuggle effect and you know, this could even turn into a romantic uh, basement trip. I'm gonna try that tonight. Thank you very much. Can I ask you a follow-up question about like, 
what proportion of horror fans do you think genuinely believe in sort of super, supernatural elements? Do you think it's a lot higher than like the average population? Do you um, think in my country? Yeah, I should be able to answer that because we looked into it in a study, but I don't remember. As far as I recall, that's not the case. Um, horror fans seem to be very kind of widely distributed. And yeah. I don't think horror fans are more likely to believe in the supernatural. Do you know, Colton? Well, I don't know for horror specifically, but for morbid curiosity, I have looked at this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there are these different, uh, there, there are different ways that people could be religious, for example. So people could be spiritual, uh, where they don't really have a, a formalized religion, but they kind of believe in spirits and ghosts. They could be more traditionally religious, uh, or they could be more agnostic or atheist, just kind of breaking them into three broad chunks. Um, and what, what I do find is that people who are spiritual do tend to be more morbidly curious uh, than people who are not. And, and the idea there probably is that, as Matthias mentioned, they think these things are real, right? So it's even more important to learn about them, right? It's even more important to be curious about these kinds of things if, if you think they're real. Um, I don't know how that lays on to horror fandom specifically, but at least with sort of the motivations for why people seek out things like horror, it does seem to be the case that people who believe in the supernatural or believe in sort of spiritual things uh, do tend to be a little bit more morbidly curious. It's not a huge effect, but it's, a, it's a, a visible one, you know, if you were to graph it. Yeah, sure. So my question is more towards sort of the psychology of it. Do you think that people watch horror more as if they want to be in the shoes of the people that, that they're watching? Or is it more of sort of them like enjoying seeing another person go when they feel safe or like what kind of sort of empathy is happening? Because I noticed you guys talked a lot about like disgust and sort of the surprise aspect of it and like the jump scare. So I was just interested in that correlation. Uh, That's okay. yeah, yeah, you want to go? No, go ahead. Uh, it just made me think of um, the, the controversy over um, so-called women in danger films back in the eighties when um, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel, who had a very popular um, movie review show, they got concerned over what they felt was a, a whole wave of films that depicted uh, women in danger. Um, and they talked about slasher films, rape revenge films and so on. Um, and they were concerned with the use of point of view shots. So as a formal aspect of cinematography, the way many of these uh, slasher films uh, are occasionally filmed from the perspective of the killer. Like if you have seen a Halloween, you'll know we see things from the perspective of Michael Myers. If you've seen Friday the 13th, the first movie, we get a lot of these point of view shots. And some people felt that the, the, the visual alignment with the bad guy entailed a kind of moral alignment. That was problematic because we were put as the audience, we were put into the shoes of the killer. Um, I don't think that's the case. I don't think um, visual alignment entails moral alignment necessarily. And also many of those films use point of view shots to hide the identity of the killer. Like how many of you know who is the killer in Friday the 13th? And don't say Jason, because if you say Jason, you haven't watched Scream. It's Jason's mom, right? But we don't know until one of the last scenes because we don't see her. Um, so I think most horror films invite the audience to empathize with the protagonists and to feel moral and visceral disgust at the, the monsters. Yeah. Um, I don't think there is very often a kind of sadistic or an invitation to, to, um, to sympathize with the, with the monsters or the, the evil, evil forces. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's generally right. Um, I mean, people, if you ask them, do sometimes report, you know, that it's, feels good to see something uh, bad happening to someone else that's worse than what's happening to me. So if I'm having a bad day and I watch a horror movie, it feels good to like, no, well, my life's not that bad, right? I'm not being chased uh, by a chainsaw, right? I'm not sure what to make of that. I don't know if that's, you know, people trying to explain why they like it and it's, it's whether or not that's the real reason, right? So we have these ideas about why we like things, but sometimes the real reason we like them is not what we can say <laughs> or not, what we, not what's uh, conscious to us. Um, I think that that's pro there probably is a bit of, uh, you know, hu humans are, are very much status oriented uh, creatures. So we're always comparing ourselves to other people. And so if you can simulate a world in which someone else is having a really shitty day <laughs> and you're, you're having a bad day, but they're having a much worse day, uh, 
I could see that making you feel better, right? I could see that actually, uh, I, I don't know if I would call it sadism, but it, you know, we do that anyway, right? We kind of, if there's someone we don't like and something bad happens to them, we get a little bit of shot in front, right? Um, so that probably happens to some extent. I did see one, one guy I was talking to actually uh, a few days ago, maybe yesterday. Uh, he was telling me that he, so he had a, a pretty rough uh, childhood coming up. Like his dad was kind of uh, an alcoholic and, and abusive. And he was telling me that he was been a horror fan since he was a kid. And he said that one thing he felt like he learned from horror films that he didn't get from other films was how, how people become tainted. So how the bad guys become the bad guys. Uh, and it's something that other films don't really give you, like other genres don't give you this, I, this insight into how normal people or good, sometimes even good people can sort of become tainted and become the bad guy. And so it offers this narrative that uh, I think other, other kinds of films don't really offer us sometimes. Um, so there, there maybe is some kind of, there's maybe is something to that, like, you know, sort of empathizing with the monster, so to speak. But I think it's more common that horror films uh, have you rooting for the protagonist, right? Have you rooting for the, the victim more often? Sorry, <laughs> um, this is kind of off of that note um, to the sense of like, it can make us feel good to maybe see people in situations that are worse than ours. Um, but back on kind of like the anxiety note where it was found that people were kind of handling COVID a little bit better if they were active horror fans. Like would, this sounds so strange, but like would a psychologist ever prescribe someone with like anxiety or a lot of fears around this time? Would they ever be like, you know what you really need to do is like watch some horror. Like, is that a prescriptive thing almost where it can like make people in a weird way feel better? Or was it more just like kind of coincidental or correlative? Uh, I mean, it would definitely, our study design was not uh, a randomized controlled clinical trial, right? It, it, was, it was correlational. Um, but, so I've, I've been asked this a lot, a lot over the last month. Do you recommend people go watch horror movies to deal with COVID? And the answer is no, because I'm not a clinical psychologist and I'm not, uh, I don't want to be responsible for some weird thing that happens, right? But there's a, a huge caveat to that in that I actually have talked to clinical, I had clinical, once that paper was published, I had some clinical psychologists who emailed me and said that they have uh, actually prescribed horror films to their patients with anxiety. Um, which I find really interesting. And I've had, I've had people tell me that their psychologist or their psychiatrist did suggest that they try this. Um, so I don't think it's, it's a crazy idea. I think it sounds weird, <laughs> but I don't think it's a, it's a crazy idea, right? It's not, especially if we can figure out why it seems to work. Because if you, if you just Google uh, horror films uh, coping with anxiety or something like that, you'll get, like I said, just dozens and dozens of op-eds um, or Reddit threads or any kind of forums of people talking about how this does work for them. So there's a, there's a substantial portion of people for which this does work. It doesn't mean it would work for everyone or for every situation. But I think if we can figure out who it works for and why it works for them, uh, then you can tailor, uh, you know, sort of clinical applications for that, right? Whether that's just go watch a horror movie or whether it's something a bit more, uh, something a bit different, but it's based on, you know, the knowledge that we gained from that. So I would say my, my go-to answer for that has been, uh, if you hate horror movies, no, don't do it because that'll probably make you more anxious. Uh, but if you, if you don't feel particularly strongly one way or another, or if you like them, it could be worth finding a, a movie that you think will scare you and try watching it, right? Try watching it with someone, that's better, right? Um, because you know the idea is not to find like the scariest movie you can you can find and watch that and, and horrify yourself into nightmares. That's that's not the idea. The idea is that you find something that's kind of on your boundary or on your limit. So one thing we found from the haunt this year, uh, when we asked people with anxiety, like people who had been diagnosed with clinical anxiety, uh, we asked them, "Do you think that the haunt helped you deal with this?" And the people who said yes, we talked to them, and. One of the most common things, I think in almost every interview, people said that it helped them learn their boundaries and helped them learn kind of to push their boundaries and to become okay with feeling like this. Um, so I don't think that's a crazy suggestion, uh, but I would, not do, I would not do the prescribing. Okay, I know it's getting uh, pretty late <laughs> in Denmark for you, but um, as like a final question to kind of wrap this up, I am very terrified of horror movies. Um, and I was wondering if you both have any tips 
for starting to watch horror movies because I do have interest and it seems like you two would be the most equipped to give me some good suggestions for what I should do to start to enjoy them more. Matthias just wrote an entire book on this. <laughs> not, not yet published. But just wrote a whole book on it and it's very good. So I will let him answer that. Thank you, Colton. Um, yeah, the book comes out next year. It's called A Very, Very Nervous Person's Guide to Horror Movies. And you would be my ideal reader. Um, and so my suggestion would be um, don't go to the movie theater. You don't want to watch a horror film in a movie theater because a movie theater is designed for minimal distraction and maximum immersion. Watch it at home with the sound down, not totally off, but keep it, keep it low with people you trust. Uh, keep the lights on, again, to minimize, um, minimize immersion, basically. You want to work against immersion. And another uh, tip would be to um, remind yourself that it's just a movie. Uh, you want to treat it as an aesthetic artifact, as a construction. Uh, the thing about movies, movies that are made according to the Hollywood paradigm, and that's movies all over the world, is that they're designed to be seamless. You're not supposed to, to notice patterns of editing. You're not supposed to notice camera movement. Um, you're supposed to be sucked in and to respond very strongly to what is happening in the, in the, in the world of the film. But you can work against that through conscious effort. Um, so if you start paying attention to, to the sound, for example, ask yourself, is the sound I'm hearing from the movie right now, um, is it diegetic or non-diegetic sound? Diegetic means it's sound that the characters in the film can hear. Non-diegetic is uh, mood music, for example. So try to look, uh, listen to sound, what kind of sound is being used, what is it being used for? Is it to unsettle you, um, distract you, put you in a certain mood? Pay attention to camera movement uh, the way the, the way the movie is framed, like if there is a character in one side of the frame and there is nothing in the other side of the frame, something is going to come into the other side of the frame. Uh, so use those kinds of strategies that will help you uh, make it through in one piece and then see if, if, if it was a good experience. And it might even bring you and your, your co-watchers closer together. That's something else we are interested in in these haunted house studies is um, bonding effects of horror movies. And then and the final piece of advice is you shoot me an email once the experiment is over. I would be very curious to hear how it went. Amazing. And then Fia just put in the chat, uh, if you all have any recommendations for horror movies to watch this Halloween, that would be really um, appreciated. But thank you both so much um, for making time to do this. It's been really fun and I've definitely learned a lot. Um, and yeah, we can, and this year, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was really fun. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wait, are you the only lab that does this? Because I was just interested, like, if anyone in the U.S. does it, like, in New York City or California. But well, yeah, but if you guys have to go, that's that's fine no, too. I do in Chicago. <laughs> uh, my lab oh, does. That's so cool. But it's not it's not as uh, widespread as you would think. I mean, I, I think actually psychology has been ignoring or overlooking horror for a long time. There were many studies back in the '80s looking at uh, the negative effects of horror movies, especially on kids and adolescents. But then it's like psychology kind of forgot about horror in the '90s and the and the zeros and even much of the tens. Uh, but now things seem to be changing, which is very cool. Yeah, I can't. So think cool because yeah, I can't think of any lab that like Matthias's lab is the only recreational fear lab that I know of. Um, it's kind of a small, small uh, academic world. Uh, so I think if there was someone, we would we would have heard of it. But I don't know of anyone uh, that does this sort of exclusively. Like I do, but I'm, I don't have my own lab. I'm a student, so I don't have my own lab. But um, I can't think of even. I mean, Margie does, but she doesn't have her lab either. She just no. does her. Uh, I can't think of anyone that does, which is not a bad thing, right? It's more work for us. Yeah, no, that's interesting because I'm like, a, I want to major in psychology. So this was all like very cool. But thank you guys so much. No, Hope no. you have a wonderful rest of your night. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Your sinister is a good one. <laughs> Whoever said sinister, that's a really good. Uh, in fact, I think that was just, uh, there was this uh, study with the heart rate. Did you, you see that, Matthias? Yeah. Sinister causes more of a heart rate spike than any other horror film. Yep. It's, pretty, it's a scary one. 
Mm-hmm. Crazy. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I found it fascinating Definitely. if no one else did. <laughs> and my friend group that I'm about to live with just texted and said the first night we're going to watch a horror movie <laughs> to all get connected. So I will let you know how that goes right. to see Please if it do. works after living for four months together. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And if you. you have, if you need anything else from us, let us know. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Good evening. Bye. Bye.